Well, thanks very much for inviting me to, um, to speak to you this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to be talking about neural organoids and why they are not brains in vats. And we already know from this morning uh, what neural organoids are, but in case you weren't here this morning, I'll just very quickly say that organoids are <coughs> tiny three-dimensional biological structures grown in vitro from various kinds of stem cells. And the structures self-organize and resemble miniature versions of real organs with realistic microanatomy. And neural organoids recapitulate aspects of the development and organization of the human embryonic brain, including things like differentiated brain regions and synchronized oscillations as recorded in, in EEG. Now, recently, some scientists have asked whether neural organoids will ever be conscious. And we had a, a two you know, rich uh, discussions of that this morning with Christoph and, and um, Pat's talk. And there, of course, have been um, questions then raised about the ethical implications of this possibility. And philosophers have started to talk about neural organoids. And some have argued that neural organoids are miniature versions of brains in vats. So this is what I'm going to be actually criticizing and arguing against as a way of making certain kinds of points about the biology of consciousness. So the brain in a vat was originally a philosophical thought experiment. It was, uh, I think it was Gilbert Harmon who first thought it up, and then Hilary Putnam wrote a lot about it in the 1980s. And the thought experiment is that we're supposed to imagine a brain removed from the rest of the body and put into a vat of life-sustaining liquid and connected to a supercomputer that gives its neurons, provides its neurons with electrical impulses identical to those it would normally receive. And of course, neural organoids aren't these kinds of brains in vats, but nonetheless, it's being suggested by some people, both scientists and philosophers, that eventually they will be like the philosopher's brain in a vat, and that it's really only a matter of time before there are conscious neural organoids. So it's this way of thinking that I want to call into question. And I'm going to, make, I'm going to do this uh, by, by way of making four points in this talk. So this is an outline of what I want to say. So I want to make some points that are, in a way, obvious if you've been here this morning about how and why neural organoids aren't, present-day neural organoids aren't brains and vats. Um, and, but then I want to actually spend some time with this thought experiment of the brain in a vat. And I want to argue that in certain ways, it's actually self-undermining. And I'll say what, what I mean by that when we get there. And this is going to lead into making the claim that the minimal instantiation of sentience is organismic and not just neuronal. And then in conclusion, I want to suggest that the conscious processes of moral interest are ones that require embodiment and the capacity to suffer. So embodiment connects to the idea of it, the process being organismic um, and sentient specifically in the sense of the capacity to suffer. So that's, that's where this talk is, is going to go. OK, so first of all, neural organoids aren't brains in vats. Well, again, if you were here this morning, I think these points are, are now going to be familiar. Here's a quotation from uh, a paper from a few years ago. I should say, actually, um, Bef be beforehand that one of the great things about being invited to this is I read a whole bunch of papers on neural organoids and I hadn't really read about anything about this before and it's utterly fascinating work and so just the opportunity to be able to do that was was really great so this is from one of the papers I read it said organoid tissue lacks essential development and patterning cues which are necessary for development into a fully formed mature organ and then as we've heard neural organoids lack vascularization um, they lack sensory motor integration and coupling with the environment. Although I wrote that before this morning's talk where I saw the robotic um, interface, which is really interesting. Um, and I think we'll connect to some things that I'm, I'm going to say in the talk. Nevertheless, and, and in fact, the point I just made uh, exemplifies this, um, research is advancing rapidly. And so we can wonder what the future has in store. And this is exactly what raises the specter of the brain in a vat. OK, so this leads me then into the second point I want to make, which is specifically focusing now on, well, how should we actually think about this notorious thought experiment? And I thought since I'm at UCSD, it would be appropriate to read a passage from Ramachandran from some years ago where he describes the brain in a vat. So he says, let's advance to a point of time where we know everything there is to know about the intricate circuitry and functioning of the human brain. With this knowledge, it would be possible for a neuroscientist to isolate your brain in a vat of nutrients and keep it alive and healthy indefinitely. Mm -hmm. 
Utilizing thousands of electrodes and appropriate patterns of electrical stimulation, the scientist makes your brain think and feel that it's experiencing actual life events. The simulation is perfect and includes a sense of time and planning for the future. The brain doesn't know that its experiences, its entire life, are not real. OK, so there's different ways to think about this thought experiment. One is, um, you know, which is how it's described here, is uh, as something that we would try to engineer in our world with our laws of nature, which is, for me, the relevant one for the purposes of this talk. And then there's the way philosophers think about it, where you can imagine all sorts of things, and you're not constrained by mundane things like our laws of nature, and you have infinite computational resources. And I'm not interested in that, because I think, along with one of my former mentors, Dan Dennett, that sometimes an impossibility in fact is more interesting than a possibility in principle. So it's the impossibility in fact of this kind of brain in a vat that I think is relevant and that I want to um, say some things about. So the thought experiment supposedly shows how the body and the environment are replaceable and inessential background conditions, whereas the brain and nothing outside the brain suffice for the realization of consciousness. But what I want to say is that actually this scenario is self-undermining in that to invent a brain properly, if we think about what that means, and I'm going to say more about that, that's going to wind up in effect giving it a functioning surrogate body. It doesn't mean it's going to have a body exactly like this, but it's going to have something that functionally is a body, not a vat. So it's no longer a brain in a vat. So the way that we see this is by actually stepping back and thinking, OK, well, what would it take to achieve a properly functioning brain in a vat? So three things I want to mention, and I'll go through each of these in, in a bit of detail. So one is keeping the brain up and running as a biological system. Second is maintaining the own endogenous, intrinsic, self-generated activity of the brain. And the third is mimicking environmental stimulation. These are all highly non-trivial, obviously. So let's take them one by one. So keeping the brain up and running means that any adequate life-sustaining system has to keep up with the brain's energetic, ionic, osmotic, and recycling needs. So it's going to need some kind of circulating system plus the necessary pumps, oxygenating devices, and whatever additional subsystems we need to maintain the physiological levels in the circulating fluid. That life-sustaining system also has to support the brain's ongoing and self-generated activity, its intrinsic activity, and it has to respond to it locally and systemically at any given instant. So that's just to keep the brain up and running. Then there's the maintenance of self-generated activity. So in this case, whatever life-sustaining system we construct, the functioning of its every part, as well as its overall coordinated activity, has to be kept within a certain range by the nervous system itself for the brain to work properly. So the life-sustaining system and the brain need to be reciprocally coupled and mutually regulating systems. Then thirdly, mimicking environmental stimulation. The stimulation that's delivered to the neuronal terminals has to mimic that obtained by the nervous system in a body. But stimulating what the brain gets from sensory motor dynamics and exploratory behavior is likely to be very difficult, maybe impossible, depending on exactly how um, robust we want the stimulation to be. And storing all the information seems to be ruled out because there's a combinatorial explosion of possibilities in a changing environment with exploratory behavior. And this is a point that Dan Dennett made in the introduction to his book, Consciousness Explained, many years ago that I think is, is um, a, a really fundamental point. And then the stimulating devices must not disrupt the life-sustaining system. That is, every stimulation affects homeostasis. So there has to be compensation or the whole system will, will crash. So I think the upshot of these kinds of thoughts is that meeting these demands suggests that the artificial stimulating devices should be controllable by the brain itself through sensory motor loops. That is to say, the brain should be equipped with real peripheral sensory motor systems. But the upshot of that is that adequately invading the brain, keeping it up and running, maintaining self-generated activity, mimicking environmental stimulation, entails giving the brain a functioning surrogate body. So if that's the case, then the brain in a vat turns out to be an autonomous sensory motor agent, the functional equivalent of an organism. It's not a brain in a vat. That is to say, any adequate vat will be a surrogate body. The so-called vat wouldn't be a vat at all. It would be an embodied agent in the world. OK, so that's a very quick run through.
through um, the brain in a vat, where this would be, um, in a way, a null hypothesis. You could think of it as a null hypothesis for the brain in a vat experiment. That our assumption should be, actually, we're going to have to embody it. OK. So third point, that the minimal instantiation of sentience is organismic and not just neuronal. So I'm using the word sentience here rather than consciousness. And I'm doing this for a particular reason. I think sentience, <clears throat> I like to think of sentience as the feeling <clears throat> of being alive. This is um, going back to work I did with Francisco Varela some, some years back. And by that I mean feelings of vitality, things like energy level, fatigue, stress, feelings of drive or instinct or urge, as well as extraceptive sensory feelings. There's a tendency when we think about consciousness immediately to emphasize the extraceptive side and to miss the larger organismic life regulation side that I'm calling the, the feeling of being alive. And I'm drawing here from <clears throat> work in cognitive science that goes under the banner of embodied theories of, of cognition. The working hypothesis of this embodied viewpoint is that the minimal realizing system for animal sentience isn't the brain or some neural subsystem, but rather an organism. That is, a self-sustaining system made up of dynamically coupled neural and non-neural systems. And I think this follows from this, as I put it, null hypothesis of the brain in a thought experiment. So that's the hypothesis we would need to reject to establish a more limited, or as some people like to call it, neurocentric or brain-bound alternative. So on this way of thinking then, sentience is organismic, not just neuronal. That is to say, sentience is a life regulation process of the whole organism, understood as an autonomous biological agent, interacting with the environment. The minimal requirements for sentience then include a living body, not just neuronal processes. And I should say when I use the word living, I mean in a functional sense. It doesn't necessarily have to be made out of exactly the same stuff um, as this kind, of, this kind of body. OK, so the line of argument I've gone through, um, I just want to give some credit, is um, coming out of some papers I did with a neuroscientist who's in Chile, Diego Cosmelli. So we have a chapter um, from a few years ago uh, in this book and then uh, another paper that we did, more sort of philosophically oriented paper. So if you're interested in like, some of the more nitty gritty details of what I went through quickly, um, you, can, you can have a look at, those, look at those papers. All right, so last point um, that I want to make is that it seems to me that conscious processes of moral interest or moral significance require embodiment and the capacity to suffer. OK. so. Um, if we're, if we're talking about our understanding of consciousness, it's unquestionable that we've made a lot of progress in recent years, specifically in modeling some of the structural and informational aspects of consciousness. So Christoph went, went into this in his talk. So I, I think this is really, you know, um, really important work. A lot of effort has gone into it. But still, to my mind, um, I don't agree that IIT tells us what consciousness is. So I think it was on one of Christoph's slides where it was asserted, um, and certainly in, um, in uh, Giulio Tononi's papers, it says that consciousness is integrated information. And I, I just am not persuaded that the equation there holds. I think that this theory provides a very good way of modeling certain aspects of consciousness, but the statement of identity seems to me to be quite strong. And you know, we could talk about this, but raises a number of, of philosophical uh, questions. In the case of sentience, it, it still doesn't seem to me to explain sentience in the sense of the feeling of being alive. It doesn't tell, it doesn't tell us what subjectivity is or what it is to be um, a, a subjective agent or a sentient being, a being with a point of view. And it doesn't really say anything about the capacity to suffer. And those are, I think, the things that are of moral importance. More generally, of course, this is the state of the field. There isn't a generally agreed upon scientific theory of consciousness, though um, this morning before we came in, Christoph was, was telling some of us about some experimental work that's going to be done to um, try to have a critical experiment to differentiate, um, the, to, to, to test the different uh, predictions from a global workspace theory and the integrated information theory. So that's very interesting, and um, that may move us in the direction of an agreed upon scientific theory of consciousness, but we're not there yet. And there's certainly no agreed upon way to measure consciousness. And some of the measures that are proposed, I just want to point out, depend on 
um, things subjects say about their experience, for example, when they're woken from deep sleep. And that depends on the kinds of questions you ask them. And there's issues about, um, in the case of deep sleep, if you wake someone and they don't report anything, it, and you ask them what was going through your mind just now, well, were they really not experiencing anything? Or are they not, is it not possible for them to consolidate it in memory as they wake up? So there are tricky questions about subjectivity in the sense of what philosophers call phenomenal consciousness, consciousness sentience in the moment, and then the ability to access it subsequently. And we, I think we can make progress on those, in those areas by refining the kinds of questions that we ask subjects, um, refining our measures. But I think there's still some, you know, some pretty open questions there. So I'm not confident that because the perturbational complexity index is low in the case of deep sleep, that means consciousness is absent. OK. So that's all just by way of saying um, there's a lot we don't know, and we don't have generally agreed upon theories and measures. Nevertheless, we can ask about the kind of biopsychological architecture that's likely to support conscious processes of moral interest. And the embodied viewpoint is that the ones that are of moral interest require, no surprise, embodiment and the capacity to suffer. And it seems unlikely these are achievable merely by neural organoids. That is, where we understand that to be brain structures or brain-like structures, neural structures, minus embodiment and minus sensory motor interface with the world. That said, the ethical challenges, it seems to me, are likely to come if and when we become capable of integrating neural organoids into synthetic autonomous agents. And as I learned this morning, it looks like actually we're a little bit further along in certain respects in that way than I, than I knew. So when we are doing much more of that, then I think we're in the domain where we may be creating sentient agents for which or for whom things matter. That is, creatures, beings, entities with interests, even if they be the minimal interest of not suffering. And there I think we, we really would have some serious ethical uh, issues that we, would have to, um, that we would have to think hard about. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. Of all the capacities of humans, that's one is to suffer, but there's, as we know, lots of other ones. Yeah. Is the not suffering being used here mostly for your theory of embodiment and cognition, or is it from your ethics, which is your, your, primarily, your primary concern in ethics is sort of a more utilitarian version, yeah. which is a concern for minimization of suffering? Yeah, it's, it's, it's both. I would say in the ethical sphere, um, I suppose this is a matter of philosophical debate, but in the ethical sphere, what strikes me as the criterion of moral standing is the capacity to suffer. Um, the utilitarians did, did and do say that. I think you can say that without being a utilitarian. So, I mean, for example, Buddhists say that, and they're not utilitarians. Um, so different moral systems across different you know, philosophical systems in the world say that in different ways. Um, but I also think if you're coming at it from an embodied cognition perspective, um, what's important is that you have a system that has, an, uh, that has autonomy, and autonomy means the capacity to generate and maintain its own identity and activity in ongoing interaction with the environment in a way where things matter for the system. And when things matter, um, you have projects, aims, feelings that can be facilitated or thwarted, and the thwarting of them is, is a kind of suffering. Um, so I think it, it's, it's not like there's a straightforward entailment out of the embodied cognition theory to that way of thinking about it, but I think the fit's pretty good. So how would you know if an organoid, let's say you put it in a robot, like Alison showed this morning, and in which condition would you know whether it's suffered? Yeah. Not just had conscious experience, but actually a versa form. So I think um, if, if you have an agent that who, who's, as it were, being is its own doing. So it's, it's self-creating, self-maintaining, and the world is, is the world that it is because of that activity. Then it seems you're going to have things like you know, approach and avoidance and pleasure and pain, all the things that you know, motivate a system. And so if, we ha if we're in the presence of those kinds of systems, then it seems to me, to be, seems to me reasonable to say that we're in the, in the presence of a system that has the capacity to suffer. So ultimately, it would be judged by avoidance reaction. If there, are, if there are certain things that this organism avoids, then presumably those are the ones that lead to, that lead to some aversive yeah. experiences. Yeah, I mean, that would certainly be one, one kind of relevant evidence, definitely.
um, motivations, selective ignoring of things as well as selective attending to things, um, approach avoidance behaviors. I mean, we see that already, I mean, as you know, um, we see this already in the so-called simplest living creatures, namely, namely bacteria. But I'm one of those people who's actually willing to entertain the possibility that sentience goes all the way down to you know, those kinds of minimal living systems. I'm a, I'm a, a kind of biopsychist in, in Heckel's, um, Ernest Heckel's terms. I'm, 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 I'm very open to that possibility, let's say, yeah. So if you were to get to the point where you could grow a brain, embody it, and then show that it was conscious, how would you explore having, say, a second brain that you never introduced any stimulus to? So you had maybe like the hardware that you could prove was capable of consciousness, but it never had any experiences to kind of um, develop consciousness? Like, is there any way you could ever do that and maybe make the co public comfortable with it if there was like a relevant way to study disease or, does that make but, sense? N not, not really, because I, I, don't, I don't know what it would mean to have a system like the brain that wasn't formed through a complicated historical process of development. So I guess, I mean, if you were to have a brain that was grown um, by a scientist and you were able to prove that that brain could walk and talk and act just like a human, what would the ethics be around having a brain that you never gave any stimulus to if you were to just grow it? Well, I, I mean, my argument is that, is, is that uh, it seems to me impossible to envision a situation in which you could have just a brain that is functionally equivalent to an embodied brain without embodying it and giving it a developmental history. So if you synthesize a brain and embody it and give it a developmental history, then I don't see any reason why we should treat it any differently from any other embodied brain with a developmental history. But I don't think you could just sort of create that without giving it the embodiment and the developmental history. But they would be ethically on the same footing for me then, um, because they both presumably be the brains belonging to sentient beings. If I understand correctly where you are trying to get, it is, um, let's suppose, yes, that you do have this brain that is in body and, and responsive to the environment. Um, the question is, on the second brain that you're going to create artificially, would that be of any ethical concern not to give the same stimulus as to the first one, since you know that the first one already responds to that. Is it deprivation for that organoid? So we're getting into like uh, elaborate thought experiments now, so I want to make sure I understand this one. So we have, say, my brain, which is embodied and gets certain kind of stimulation, and now we've created a brain an organoid brain that is embodied in some way that's functionally equivalent to me or to a human being, and the question is whether to give it the same stimulation or not? I, it... I, I, I was not thinking about the human brain, but we can make that association. I mean, we know that the human brain will develop uh, to have sensory inputs and to respond to the environment. Now, um, uh, I think the question would be, uh, is just not ethical to let the human brain develop in a natural way oh, without all, all the sensory uh, inputs to fully develop as a person, right? Yeah. So if, if, if we have that feeling from a normal human embryonic brain, would that be fair for an organoid as well? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, in the normal embryonic brain, of course, you don't just have a brain developing in uterus. You have a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, so uh, you already have, you know, complicated embodiment and sensory motor coupling from very, very early on uh, as part of the developmental history. And if it's just, I don't want to say just, but if it's an organoid minus those things, um, then it doesn't seem to me obvious that there's an ethical injunction that it be given those things. Uh, as far as I can see standing up here right now, I mean, I could be wrong about that, but for in the moment, yeah. Thank you.